Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this joint South Asia Institute and South, uh, SOAS China Institute webinar on uh, this afternoon on the Sino-Indian crisis. Um, my name is Avinash Paliwal. I am the deputy director of the SOAS South Asia Institute and a senior lecturer in international relations at the Department of International Studies, uh, Politics and International Studies. We have today with us a very distinguished panel uh, with Dr. Jabin Jacob joining us from Shivnandar University. Dr. Jacob is a, an associate professor at the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies at SNU India, as well as an adjunct research fellow at the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. For anyone who's even mildly interest, interested in India's relationship with China historically, and in contemporary context, you cannot afford to miss uh, the brilliant analysis that Jabin has been offered, uh, has been offering to us for, for some time. And we are very much looking forward to his forthcoming book uh, on India's relationship with China, which promises to be a comprehensive history of this relationship. And in addition to Jabin, we have Professor Steve Sang joining us this afternoon as well. He's the director of the SOAS China Institute and also an Emeritus Fellow at the St. Anthony's College at Oxford, as well as an Associate Fellow at Chatham House. Again, if you're following anything related to China, it's foreign policy, it's strategic affairs, there is, it's, it's unlikely that you have missed Steve's analysis, both in terms of journal articles, books, and a very rich array of media commentary and analysis. I'm grateful that both of you are, are, here, are able to join us this afternoon, Steve and Jabin. I would not keep, uh, I, won't, I won't, you know, delay this any further. Uh, just a quick note, you'll have about 10 to 12 minutes uh, to make a pitch and then we'll continue the conversation before I open the platform for the panelists and to, uh, for the uh, to attendees. And to the attendees, thank you for joining us. But if you have any questions that come up, you'll see a, a chat box, uh, a QA and a box actually on the bottom of your Zoom page please feel free to write your question. I'll be reading out the questions at the end uh, once we have had the initial presentation. But if you're interested in speaking out and spelling out your question yourself, just raise the hands during the Q&A itself. With those words, Jabin, could I request you first to come and kind of really give an outline of what you think uh, has gone wrong as, as, as we see in terms of India's response to sort of Chinese aggression in the Himalayas, but not just about the border standoff, also reflect a little bit on the larger strategic contours of this relationship and where this is headed. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. Um, uh, it's an honor to share the stage with Professor Steve Sang. And, you know, good to see Avinash also after, uh, I mean, under very changed circumstances from the last time. Um, so I want to start off by saying that um, I sort of was originally looking at this from a India point of view, because the South Asia Institute was involved, but since OAS China is also involved, I thought I'd speak a little bit also about um, how the Xi Jinping uh, administration has gotten its India policy wrong as well. And I'm hoping to sort of get some uh, reactions also from Professor Sang. Um, so in 10 minutes, what do I say about the present uh, Sino-Indian crisis? Uh, you know, I think for a Western audience, uh, it's surely the case that this was not really the most important China question. Uh, but, you know, there are two parts to this problem, of course, that is one is that when something happens within India and Pakistan, everyone and their uncle in the West is worried about how things are going to spiral out of control uh, between two nuclear armed neighbors. Uh, but China and India are also nuclear armed neighbors. Uh, so that's the first uh, issue there. The second is, uh, you know, why that this uh, lack of attention to the, what's been going on uh, on the India-China boundary is that, you know, the West has consistently ignored Indian warnings uh, about China or Indian analysis about China's rise and activities for a very long time. Post Tiananmen is one, uh, the launch of the BRI is another. I mean, it's ignored these warnings or analysis until it could no longer do so. Now, this is, of course, not to say that the Indian government got its policies right. Uh, now, why is this so? I think one uh, 
this government, the, the BJP government under Narendra Modi, um, is a different government from its predecessors in terms of its expertise on Indian foreign policy or on India's China policy specifically. And one has to sort of separate the government from the analysts. I mean, I think the analysts in India still get their China correct uh, by and large, but the government itself, I believe is a little wet behind the ears as far as China is concerned. It has good people within the system to advise it, but it does not seem to be the case that it has taken this advice very seriously. And I say this for a number of reasons. One, uh, the government came in in 2014 uh, with a bang on the Tibet and Taiwan policy. Both the uh, Tibetan representative uh, as well as the Taiwanese representative were invited to Narendra Modi's swearing in ceremony. But after those high optics, uh, you know, this sort of policy sort of well fell by the wayside. Second, uh, the government, the Indian government was engaged in very poor PR in the wake of the Doklam standoff in Bhutan. I think it pretty much let the Chinese run away with the narrative internationally. Uh, but by far the largest, the biggest mistake that the government made was to engage in these so-called informal summits with uh, between you know, Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi and whose some achievement, I think uh, was some of his achievements has been to get India blindsided by the current crisis on the LAC. Now, also in the wake of the crisis, I think the government has spread its energies rather thin by expanding the ambit of talks, in the beginning at least, to beyond the military commander level, uh, the working mechanism, of course, uh, on the boundary dispute already, of course, that kicked in. But there were also meetings between the foreign ministers and the special representatives on the boundary talks, which is to say that the talks uh, went on at a political level. Whereas my, uh, I mean, any, my assessment is that this is not a crisis that is going to be resolved by political talks. China has uh, you know, done what it could, taking full well uh, into account the fact that uh, there would be consequences, uh, that they were going to um, anger the Indians, that they knew very well they, what they were getting into. So it's not something that can be resolved politically. If it's a the military issue on the ground at the LAC, it can only be talks uh, between the military commanders or actions between the military commanders that will result in a resolution to this. Or if not a resolution, then a permanent stalemate. Um, now, while certainly it is true that India reacted fast, uh, it did uh, post COVID at least uh, not, and before this crisis sort of took off uh, in a big way, it had restricted Chinese investments. But uh, subsequently, it banned Chinese apps. It scaled up its interest in military ties with the US and other members of the Quad, Japan and Australia. But fundamentally, there seems to be a belief within the Indian government that this situation can somehow be resolved, can somehow be turned around by offering China the right incentives. And I argue that this is a mistake and that a mistake that arises from a fundamental inability to understand the nature of the CCP and the Chinese political system of believing that the Chinese foreign ministry somehow acts just like any other foreign ministry uh, in any other country, and which we know is not true, take into account the world foreign diplomacy. Now, some acknowledgement of this is evident. The Indian ambassador in Beijing uh, has not only met the MOFA authorities, but he's also met the Central Military Commission as well as CCP officials. Uh, but overall, as with the CCP, so also in India, for the political class, admitting mistakes is somewhat anathema. And uh, I don't think from current evidence, the government still knows what needs to be done in order to resolve this issue. Or if the government understands or believes that this is not a crisis that is going away, that the stalemate is here to stay, then uh, it has not yet thought of a policy or an approach to make this evident to, or, or to sort of sell this idea to the general public or even to the China studies community in India. Now, in terms of what mistakes she has made uh, in China, I think overall China's South Asia, South Asia capacity is rather weak. There is no doubt uh, to my mind that Xi Jinping is being advised rather poorly uh, on India and on, on South Asia in general, uh, even though to Indians, it looks like the Chinese are employing a master strategy in the rest of South Asia. 
So as a result, I think uh, she underestimates India. And, but also fundamentally, even if we were advised well, I argue that she would still get his policies on India wrong, essentially because of structural factors, which is that if China, the Chinese system uh, that has sort of been, you know, shaped in, to such an extent to deal in terms of a competition with the United States, were to acknowledge that India were a problem that would take the focus off China and the supposed inevitable inevitability of China catching up with the United States. Essentially, if China cannot handle a crisis with India, remember Chinese have also lost, lost soldiers in this uh, conflict in Galwan in June, how is China going to deal with the United States? Now, the Indian army was certainly caught napping, but training and contingency planning kicked in pretty quickly. And, you know, uh, this is the Indian army is essentially a 20th century army with a 19th century ethos that actually finds glory in expending men and material to recover from foul ups. But for this very reason, uh, you know, it should also not be taken lightly on the LAC. Now you could argue that China seems to be handling the prices pretty well, that it is using the opportunity to assess Indian strengths and weaknesses to put the PLA through its spaces. Uh, you know, um, sometimes I wonder if she is not doing a Tung Shaoping in terms of pushing uh, you know, the PLA to fight Vietnam as a way of quickening uh, internal reforms in one of the most toughest or recalcitrant organizations within the Chinese political system. But this is not 1979 and uh, she's PLA is likely to take a long, uh, much longer time to get through his spaces. In uh, a battle terrain, I would remind you that does not seem to help in any sort of planning or contingencies involving Taiwan or the United States. So. It's, it's a bit, uh, I mean, that has to be kept in mind. Now, she continues, what are the mistakes that China is continuing to make? I think she's actions, unwillingness to apologize to India or to restore status quo ante April 2020 has fast forwarded a whole set of relationships and actions by India that would otherwise not have taken place at the same pace. I referred already to the Quad. I referred to the investments, uh, the restrictions on Chinese investments in the tech space. But it has also raised the volume, certainly, uh, on the debate within India on India's own military reforms and restructuring. Uh, some steps have been taken, but I think more are on the anvil. And China, I think, continues to ignore overtures that Indian side is making. I mean, India hasn't banned Huawei. India hasn't said that Huawei cannot take part in 5G um, uh, tenders in inside India. Huawei is very much a part of 5G trials already happening in India. And the general ignorance of the Chinese system at the highest echelons of the Indian government will only last so, so far or so long. And it's a mistake, it's an opportunity that the Chinese are ignoring to walk back from their mistakes. Because if the current set of Indians in government, in power in New Delhi, were to smarten up, smarten up about the CCP as much as the Americans have done in recent years, then there will be no turning back. So in conclusion, I'd like to make two large statements. One, uh, despite rhetorical claims and practical actions that seem to underline the importance of sovereignty uh, in bilateral dealings with other nations, both China and India, uh, and India, if its present brand of politics continues and if its power increases, both China and India conceive the sanctity of their territorial integrity as applying only to themselves and not to other countries. So in this present Sino-Indian crisis, we see this reality in operation. The second uh, is a still larger point. I would argue that therefore concepts like Tianxia or what I call new Tianxia as uh, of, for China's brand of BRI foreign policy and Akhand Bharat or maybe translated better as Greater India in India need to be taken more seriously as sort of guiding or organizing principles of Indian and Chinese foreign policy going forward. And that really should be the greater concern in Sino-Indian relationship uh, than any deployment of forces along the LAC currently or any putative threat of an immediate conflict. And I will stop with that. Thank you. Even thank you so much for a really kind of comprehensive coverage of a very complex issue in such a short time period. I really appreciate that. Um, Steve, before I come to you, this is something very interesting that, uh, that Jibin has raised, is this idea of strategic images, to borrow my colleague Manjit Paddesi's kind of uh, 
terminology that he's used in, in this article that he wrote uh, that explores the initiation of Sino-Indian rivalry for the one for the century before 1949, essentially, right? And how the strategic images these countries have developed, especially of rivals uh, vis a -vis each other, starting 1959, the, the, the crisis and 1962 war, there seems to be an endurance of that image. Jabin has outlined the issue of you know various issues, various problems with India's dealing with it, and he used you know this is something which I'll come back to you, Jabin. Uh, wet, the government of India is wet behind the years. I'll come back to you on this one, uh, given the expertise that we see uh, being being fielded by Delhi on this issue. Steve, what do you have to say about Xi Jinping's kind of uh, both the long term and the larger strategic outlook when 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 he is and his coterie is looking at India? And where does that fit into the larger domestic uh, politics of, of, of this regime? Of course, Jevin has mentioned that there are some contradictions there, but it'll be great to have you weigh in on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Avinash, for that, and also for the uh, really interesting thoughts that you share, um, Jevin. I will focus my uh, next 10, 11 minutes on China and hopefully address some of the issues that um, Avina has, has raised. I'll start off by saying that if we look at the current poor state of relationship between India and China and the incident earlier in the summer, I haven't really seen any evidence that China was acting out some kind of a master plan. Um, there was no clear strategic instruction from Beijing to the um, garrison in Tibet to provoke an incident with uh, India. I simply haven't seen any evidence to suggest that. What I have seen, and this perhaps uh, echoes what uh, the question that Avinar was asking, is that Xi Jinping has created an environment and an in incentive system for the local commanders of the PLA garrison to be rather assertive. And it was in that assertiveness in the spring that elicited strong, robust response from the Indian side, which resulted in an incident. Now, I don't know who started the first, through the first fist fight. I think in some ways it doesn't really matter very much. It was the whole situation being created of one side pushing very hard and the other side responding in a robust way. At, at some point, things got out of hand. And I think that is basically where we are. And once we have seen that significant border incident, the Chinese have to reinforce. So have India. Both sides have enforced their, their, their troops at the front. Both sides have exercised a certain element of uh, restraint of, on their forces. But the basic situation hasn't changed. The basic dynamics hasn't changed. So moving forward, I think it's difficult to see how and why the conditions that could lead to the um, violence in the summer can be prevented in the coming year or two. I don't think either side is in a rush to try to have another incident, but the conditions remain. What I think is also interesting is that after the incident in the summer, the Indian side came out with a fairly clear narrative of what happened and the casualties. The Chinese are completely quiet about it. Now, often we simply say, oh, well, the Chinese don't like to talk about these sort of things. Quite right, they don't usually like to talk about these sort of things. But if they have come out very, very well, then would they really have been so reticent about their losses? <laughs> I, think, I think we have to um, face a reality that even though we do not know what the actual casualty figures suffered by the POH was, there's a fairly good likelihood that the Chinese have not come out tops in the fisticuff with the Indians. 
and they might well have lost rather more soldiers than the Indian army had. And this does raise an issue which kind of um, echoes the point that you, Javian, has made about um, the Chinese not taking the Indians so seriously and Avinash talking about the um, strategic imaging. If we look at it as international relations scholar, realist, India is or should be considered either as a peer competitor of China or at least a near peer competitor of China. Either way, you would expect China to take India very, very seriously. And in a way that China certainly does take Japan very, very seriously because Japan is being seen by the Chinese as a peer competitor. Now, reality is the Chinese don't take India as seriously as one would expect them to, or that they would be well advised to, or that they should be. And by not taking India quite so seriously, then we get into this even bigger problem that it is even more difficult for the Chinese party state to accept in any kind of confrontation with India that China does not come out tops. Um, it's one thing to, go, to confront the United States and have to pull back and not come out tops. Regrettable as that may be. From the Chinese perspective, that's with India on the other side is simply not a tolerable state of affair or prospect. So what we will be seeing, I think, is that the Chinese are going to take a robust stance over the border region. Um, and the border region is in fact a strategically important one because it is where the main strategic highways from, 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 from Tibet gets into uh, India. And they are not going to make any concessions over there. Is Xi Jinping um, poorly advised? I think we then get into a very awkward situation that if we look at Chinese policy making over the last, say, 20, 25 years, over that kind of time frame, on the whole, Chinese policy making got better and better. And the policymakers, top level uh, leader, got better advice and better information almost consistently. Now that happens until Xi Jinping became not just the top leader, but the parang, parang, paramount leader. By the 19th Party Congress 2017, when Xi Jinping became in effect a strong man leading the Communist Party, rather than the first among equals in the Politburo Standing Committee, we have a change in the situation in policy making process in China. Who now in the Chinese policy making establishment, be it the foreign minister and above, all the ways to Xi Jinping's colleagues in the Politburo Standing Committee, is going to say to him that with the greatest respect, sir, um, we got a problem, whether it's over India or anywhere, because you created the incentive for wolf warrior diplomats and if you created conditions for wolf warrior diplomats and no wolf warrior Chinese diplomats have ever been punished, what do you expect Chinese generals and colonels and captains to do? Would they be ship warrior or they will be wolf warriors? It doesn't take a lot to see why China is in a, in, in a difficult situation. But that's simply no longer an acceptable way of advising the top leader. So you do get into a situation where I think uh, you are right in saying that the Chinese top leadership is not as well advised as it would like to be or it should be in the relationship with India. But that problem fundamentally will exist because of the unwillingness on the part of the Chinese establishment as a whole to take India as seriously as it should, as a peer competitor, or at least 
near peer competitor. There is also, I think, an issue that the Chinese Communist Party fundamentally believe that China, by definition, is never an imperialist. That China, by definition, is not aggressive. So if there is a problem over the borders, it's usually the other side who's created the problems, not us. We are just defending the sacred territory of China. They also don't see that the uh, BLI, the Belt and Road Initiative, can be seen by some countries and others as rather, um, if not aggressive, at least very assertive externally. And that India will have a very good reason why it doesn't really want to be part of the BLI initiative. They don't see it quite in those terms. They also don't quite see that India, as indeed the case with quite a few of China's neighbors, both to the West and to the South, are very uncomfortable with the mega hydro projects the Chinese government have planned for and putting some of them into reality. Uh, water shortage is going to be a problem in South, Central and Southeast Asia. We are already seeing water flow to some of the great rivers of South and Southeast Asia dropping. And a lot of it is because of what happens in the Tibetan Plateau under Chinese sovereign control. And they too have a water shortage problem in North China, a very severe water shortage problem in North China. So moving forward, I would regrettably have to draw the conclusion that it really doesn't look very good. Uh, I am not predicting a major war between India or China anytime soon, but I find it very, very difficult to see that uh, tension being reduced. And the fact that Chinese foreign policy under Xi Jinping is significantly geared to make the world safe for authoritarianism, which kind of make uh, the Indian Prime Minister Modi a rather more welcome figure in the Chinese strategic calculation, will not go far enough to cement that relationship. Yes, I think Xi Jinping liked Modi because Modi is more like him than some of Modi's predecessor. But on the other hand, your basic differences and conflicts of interest remained. On this rather less than cheerful note, I will stop and hand it back to you, Evnash. Steve, thank you so much for kind of giving, you know, some very important insight into Chinese policy making and how important perhaps personalities can be in, 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 in Beijing, especially with the rise of Xi Jinping, perhaps even a violent rise of Xi Jinping, even from the, you know, kind of a domestic perspective of China uh, as the paramount leader. There's really a lot to unpack here, but before I kind of, you know, focus on a couple of themes, which I think are important and perhaps our audiences would also be keen to, to, be, to hear a little bit more about. Just a quick note to everyone who's attending this webinar, this panel, please, I've already started seeing questions coming in, comments coming in from both the Facebook Live as well as the Zoom, Zoom session. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A chat box. If you want to raise the question and spell it out, speak it out, please raise your hands. Uh, I'll try to keep, you know, take questions in order, you know, first come first and ba first of basis, but, uh, but you know, you can, you can use both those options. Now, to both Jabin and Steve, okay, you know, I want to kind of focus a little bit. One thing that, one theme that comes out very strongly based on your presentations is the fact that both India and China's leaderships despite their constitution, and by constitution, I mean, you know, despite how they are going about dealing with their, with their domestic politics, the structures that have kind of enabled them their rise, uh, whether it was the CCP's internal, internal structures, which led to the rise of Xi Jinping the way he did. And we have had history of that kind of centralization of authority in Beijing before, uh, or, or Modi's rise, right, based on a very powerful ideological impulse uh, 
which has also kind of come with a lot of uh, sensitivity towards, perhaps unreasonably so, and sometimes violently so, uh, that against criti criticism and dissent. I see that both these countries are talking at a cross road. They're, they're, they're talk talking at cross purposes here. They, they don't want to actually, uh, they're not invested in actually understanding what the other side really wants, or else kind of have reached a conclusion at the same time. You know, this is where the contradiction lies. Either China doesn't know India at all, or China knows India very well. Either India does not understand China at all, or the government of India is being way behind the years, or else the analyst and the strategic community in Delhi understands China very well. For me, that's quite, quite a broad spectrum and somewhat contradictory spectrum to make sense of. So if both of you could kind of, you know, spell a bit more about policy making. Jevin, you said uh, that this government made a mistake and you listed a series of mistakes and has also kind of you know uh, whether it was the the Wuhan summit or the summit in Chennai the focus on personal diplomacy between Modi and Xi Jinping on Prime Minister Modi's demand uh, but also the strengthening of international li alliances right in this whole rubric of Indo-Pacific that we hear increasingly so uh, even though whether it has metal or not needs to be seen the I, the discussion the volume around Indo-Pacific the volume around Quad the fact that there are arguments now being made that India has moved out of its shell on South Asia as being its strategic backyard and is much more welcoming of uh, strategically aligned powers, most of whom are from the Western Hemisphere, really, uh, and Japan, of course. Uh, would you say? Would you then still say this is a mistake on part of India's policy making? Because unlike pre twenty fourteen, some argue, and this is especially from the from the kind of Hindu right canon that comes, that we have had a very clear policy of taking China on. Yes, we are trying to engage, we are trying to manage this relationship at a top level because we think that uh, the Chinese leadership worked top down. So we want to focus on that relationship rather than building all, uh, you know, building capacities on the operational or the tactical level, perhaps. Of course, that might be a mistake, but there is a very clear sense uh, coming out from New Delhi that we are decoupling economically for a reason. We are kind of building these alliances uh, with the Americans, which have taken a very unprecedented kind of tone in recent months uh, in the defense sector, at least, um, for a very good reason. How, how do you square this, this narrative and these actions with this very kind of very clear analysis that you offered of it being a mistake, right? This is, if you can unpack that aspect a little bit, uh, you know, that would be very helpful. Steve, the question for you is, you mentioned that, uh, there is that China has historically not taken India seriously the way perhaps it does Japan for historical good reasons, capacity reasons, but also history, uh, as well as, of course, the United States. There is an argument being made these days that the 2017 Doklam standoff was to some extent a turning point, not just in the bilateral relationship, but also in the way uh, Beijing would value strategically India's rise. And that many, some of the most kind of, you know, influential kind of thinkers within, within this administration, within this regime, have already made this assessment that India is actually a lost cause, that you can afford to push India to a corner, you can afford to, uh, you know, create the standoff and, you know, for whatever reason, whether it was revocation of Article 317 in Kashmir in 2019, or whatever the tactical reason uh, might have been, but they have, they see India as a lost cause in a strategic sense. Would you say that is correct? And if that is not correct in your view, and that they must take it India much more seriously than they than they do, how do you see what is the threshold of change really? You know, at the moment it doesn't seem that the two countries will go to war because it's not in neither of the two, two's benefit. But I am still struggling to locate what would make China rethink. Uh, perhaps you know, short of some senior advisor coming and whispering in Xi Jinping's ear that look, you've made a mistake here. What else would it be? Uh, on the ground, either, you know, the losses that perhaps the PLA might have to sustain or for some sort of internal crisis, which might not be visible to outside observers, but might be festering inside because of these issues. And of course, the other panoply of issues that China is facing today, whether it's the crisis, you know, with Taiwan, the situation in Hong Kong, it's larger sort of alienation of the Western world as, at large. Where will, do you think, what would be the turning point in Chinese thinking and action here? Sorry, that took me some time to flesh out, but floor is all yours. Uh, Jibin, could I request you to come in first? All right. Uh, thank you, Avinash. Um, let me start by, first of all, saying that I agree with what uh, Professor Sang is saying. I mean, uh, fundamentally, I, I mean, I'd underline everything that it said. I just want to underline 
two points from my side, which is I agree that there was no master plan, uh, that this is something that happened at the border and it escalated. But the larger point is that this was something that was waiting to happen. Uh, these physical confrontations have been going on for quite a bit of time. And I would say that there has been a change in Chinese patrolling behavior, Chinese activity on the LAC since at least 2013, uh, when the first um, Depsang uh, confrontation took place, which was a complete change in the Chinese pat uh, patrolling pattern in which they came uh, to dispute a territory and set up camp and refused to move until the Indians threatened to cancel uh, Lee Ho Chiang's visit uh, to India. I mean, that was his first state visit since taking over as premier. So that's one. Uh, so this was, it had to happen. If not to, uh, in June or in May, uh, it would have happened sometime sooner or later. That's structurally, that was what was going on. Uh, the infrastructure developments on both sides were becoming problematic for the, uh, I mean, the, the advantage that the Indians were able to develop with even the limited infrastructure development was something that Chinese commanders on the ground were, I think, refusing to countenance. Uh, I also agree that it doesn't matter who started the fight, but I would like to add that uh, uh, at meetings with the Chinese after uh, this incident, they themselves have admitted to losing troops. So that's something that uh, is, I mean, we don't know the numbers, but it's a fact that they have lost troops. Um, next, to come to your questions, Avinash, uh, see, first of all, I think, um, I say it's a mistake because you have to focus on the results. Uh, it's one thing to talk about you know, the one thing to actually put forward a lot of rhetoric, but what are the results? Um, some of these trends, I would first of all argue were already in play uh, well before this government took office. Uh, I mean, the closeness, the turn to the United States, for example, started well in advance. In fact, if you look, if you remember in 2005, we concluded this major uh, treaty with the Chinese on the agreement on political principles and uh, guiding principles and political parameters on settling the boundary dispute. Now that was seen as a major breakthrough. Even the Indian side was surprised that the Chinese actually agreed to sign on to the Rotterdam Dine for that. But that was 2005 and I think post 2008, the Chinese had a very different view of the world uh, once they saw the financial crisis and its impact on the United States and Western economies. So I think that sort of changed their uh, outlook on the world a bit. Uh, but also in 2005 is when India concluded the next steps in strategic partnership with the United States. So already India was thinking forward to a time where I think they understood that the rising gap in the economies and the military budgets between the two sides would come to be a problem in India-China relationship. Now, in terms of this government, what is the problem is that it's come with a particular worldview without quite understanding that there requires, I mean, it requires a certain capacity as well. And uh, the focus has largely been on sort of negating the benefits or the gains of the past uh, rather than building on those gains because that's part of the political project of this particular government. Uh, it has cut funds to institutions studying China, for example, including my own, the last one that I used to work at the Institute of Chinese Studies. Uh, it you know, talked about Project Mossum, which uh, seemed to be a cultural project, but which people sort of thought would also be something of a rival to the, uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative. It never, re never really went anywhere. Uh, you have the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor with the Japanese, which one doesn't hear of too much. You have the Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal Economic Corridor. Again, one doesn't hear too much, though there is some movement, perhaps slow and steady wins race. But, you know, you also need big ticket items and you need to make impact because that's also part of the game with the Chinese are playing, right? They make uh, 10 sound like it's 100. So that image building exercise, India fails at miserably. Uh, second, uh, and also importantly here, India seems to have closed all doors to Pakistan. Now, you know, this problem with this two front threat, a two front theory that Indians keep talking very glibly about is that, look, we simply cannot manage a two front threat. So either you consider China as your most important consideration, and sort of open the doors to Pakistan, look at how you can engage with Pakistan, or you know you don't pick a fight with the Chinese, right? Because if Pakistan is your central concern, at the moment it looks like you've closed your doors to both, right? So I think there's the problem. And there's a general inability to move quickly, even on matters that you think is of self-interest, say the relationship with Taiwan, the relationship with the United States and so on. 
One final point is that, look, we are not acting the same way as the United States or other Western countries are vis-a-vis -vis China. China is a neighbor. We understand there are complications. Uh, we cannot simply cut off uh, Chinese enterprises from the Indian market because we know that the West isn't going to reduce its prices because we've uh, you know, cut off the Chinese. It's going to jack up its prices. So we also need to retain our leverage uh, bargaining power with both sides in this conflict or in this crisis. So that's also a consideration that the, uh, forces the Indian government to move slowly, to move carefully, and perhaps too carefully. Yeah, I'll stop with that. Thank you, Jim. Steve, floor is all yours. The, I think, very important questions you put to me, Avinash, is what will we take for Xi Jinping to take India seriously? I think there's not a huge amount that um, can be done to get, in, get Xi Jinping to take India very seriously. Um, Xi Jinping is a fairly ideological type of leader. You, you can debate and discuss what ideology he's talking about, but his approach is fundamentally an ideological one. He's not an intellectual one. So for him to actually uh, do the analysis and see, well, actually, really China has to take India very seriously for a whole range of reasons. Um, it's just not going to likely to happen. So for that to happen, I think we're going to have to see uh, something that has to happen externally that will stare Xi Jinping in the face, that he will then realize that if he doesn't take India seriously, he is going to put China at a significant disadvantage. Or to the extent that he will start asking that question of his advisors, do we need to take that in country called India seriously? I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that. Now, what kind of things are we talking about that will let, uh, make Xi Jinping pay notice um, to a major country like India? I think if India itself is being taken very, very seriously in a positive way by the major Western powers, in particular, the United States. Then the Chinese will start to pay more attention to what's going on there. What's their game? Is there something that I need to worry about? Is there something that I have to do about India as to address this? I think that is one, one, one thing that will take him, um, get Beijing to pay serious attention to India in a very um, proactive and um, positive sort of way. The second one is a very negative uh, way of getting China's attention. If India asserts itself as the master of the Indian Ocean, that again, I think will get the attention of the Chinese. Uh, one of the strategic developments under Xi Jinping is that China sees itself as increasingly a global power. And if you look at the kind of military modernization program that the Chinese have had under Xi Jinping, far more focus been devoted to the Navy and then the Air Force, and only after that, the land forces. So the marine time security is a very important factor for the Chinese and Indian Ocean happens to be a strategically very important part of this Chinese calculation. Nothing quite like South China Sea, nothing quite like the immediate Western Pacific within the so-called first island chain. I mean, that takes first priority. But once you are looking at the longer term strategic uh, security of China, of its natural resources and energy resources, then the Indian Ocean is strategically very important. It's right in the middle of the Marine Time Silk Road. It is right there for the security of Chinese energy and mineral resources from uh, Africa and the Middle East. It's it's very important, but I don't think it's a particularly 
uh, helpful way for India is to get the Chinese to pay attention to India by being seen as a, a strategic national security threat. I think the first option would have been a much more positive and constructive way for India to get the Chinese government to pay it due notice and uh, take it seriously and engage in a more constructive ways to develop the relationship. Thank you, Steve. I'll now, the, the floor is open. There are quite a few questions there. Uh, let me start with the first question that really came here from the Facebook Live by Amri Shari. Where and how do you see India's neighborhood first policy, the Act East policy kind of planning in the background of the recent developments going from here? Jabin, I think this is, you're well suited to take this question. There's another question by Rushali Saha. Uh, perhaps, Steve, this could be for you. Was Beijing, Beijing's unprovoked aggression China's way of testing uh, US-India relations? Now, uh, I appreciate you said that this was not planned. There's no evidence for a kind of top level planning, but the incentive structures were created. But once the deed is done, once the situation, once the clash happened in Galwan in June, uh, do you think, apart from doing the calculus, you know, the matter on losses in terms of military losses and, and the loss of lives of soldiers. Has there been an appreciation in China about India's relationship with the US and whether this is going forward or not? Because you mentioned this is one way of one way how China, Beijing would take India, India seriously. A related question that has come up, perhaps both of you can really kind of spell this out, Jabin and Steve, uh, is there is a concern in Delhi that China is not understanding the fact that the economics of this relationship, right? The, this very powerful kind of trade fundamentals of this relationship, which are coming into question, uh, whether it's by symbolic app bans, whether in much more substantial way, the new FDI policies that the government of India introduced earlier this year, and the very clear decision taken uh, by policymakers that this 26 odd billion dollars worth of Chinese investment in Indian startups, this is something that we need to relook and re-strategize and rethink how we take forward. Uh, in Indian thought, the boundary situation and the economics are related issues. They are not separate issues. They cannot go hand in hand, uh, you know, as they perhaps have been during the 87, 88 to 2012 period when we can call a larger moment of thaw between these two relationships. Uh, Steve, why is it, is it really true that China thinks of these two trades, trade and, you know, the, the economic leg of this relationship and security issues separately? Thank you. Whoever would like to come in, Jim and Steve. Um, I mean, I, I, I can come in first with your, with, with your very subspecific uh, China-India China, economic side of the story. Now, the Chinese government put economic relationship and geopolitical objectives together all the time. Um, it is not something that they are hesitant about. They don't separate them at all. They regularly weaponize economic trading investment relationship with other countries in putting pressure on the other side to ban. Um, the current dispute with Australia is a good example. Your um, recent ex ex example with uh, South Korea and the deployment of the THAAD anti-missile system is another, and then the list goes on. So uh, the effect that the Indians will relate economic relationship with the border uh, incident is not something that they don't uh, expect or take seriously. And whether, why they don't take it quite so seriously is the sheer size of the, the Chinese, side, Chinese economy and compared to the Indian one. Um, they don't find it that threatening. Um, I think, and that's why they are not taking it quite as um, seriously as it uh, would be the case. I think if you are here substituting India by the uh, USA or by the EU as single actor uh, with that kind of economic relationship, I think the, the, the effect would be much more powerful on the uh, Chinese side in their, in their calculation. Thank you, Steve. Jibin. Okay, um, so I did briefly refer, maybe not in so many words, to India's neighborhood 
policy, I think the first thing I said was India needs to fix its ties with Pakistan. If uh, it has to take China seriously, if it has to have the resources to devote to China. But uh, of course, we have to be realistic. And uh, the China-Pakistan relationship is one part of uh, keeping India busy, right? And so even if India were to make the approaches, it's not certain that the Ch Pakistanis would accept. Uh, uh, perhaps it's too early for that. The Pakistanis need a little more experience with uh, the Chinese through their China-Pakistan economic corridor before uh, they realize exactly what's going on. Um, some of the initiatives that India has set out in the neighborhood, like BBI, and like I said, uh, some advances have been made, but not enough, not quickly enough, perhaps. And of course, India did very poorly by its uh, fuel blockade of Nepal, which uh, really is, I think, some sort of a turning point in that relationship, uh, which really, I mean, look, India's, uh, China's presence in India's neighborhood is really all of India's doing. India let the ball uh, slip. I mean, it has sort of made the so rather obnoxious statements or actions that has allowed China's space in in India's own in India India's South Asia neighborhood. Having said that, it has we have to remember that the Chinese, as the Chinese keep reminding us, that this neighborhood is also a neighborhood for Ch China. So uh, the Chinese also have a right to be in that area. Um, I think uh, we need to have a little more open mind. Uh, I mean, a more open mind on China's economic presence in the neighborhood, but also. Um, and this brings me to the economic part of the question, which is that uh, we need to be wary of China's presence in the tech space in any of these countries, because that would mean uh, blocking India's presence in this uh, in this sphere in any of these uh, India's neighbors. Um, but cutting off China completely is not feasible because we need some basis for a continuing relationship. And we need to remember and acknowledge that without cheap Chinese telecom equipment, much of India's economic growth or even India's social revolution because of that economic growth would not have been possible. So we need to give the Chinese their due. Uh, but as Professor Sang reminded us, uh, India doesn't intend to be stuck up a gum tree like the Koreans or the Australians uh, when the Chinese use economic leverage against India. And currently um, that's not possible because uh, you know the deficit is India's and therefore China has a greater amount to lose than India does. Uh, so I think uh, maybe one way forward is to find a middle ground on the BRI. I think India doesn't have to be so uh, hard up on the BRI. There are elements of the BRI where India can cooperate without compromising its position on the territorial dispute on the CPEC. Uh, you know, I think that sort of uh, flexibility India also needs to show under the circumstances. But uh, that's not happening anytime soon, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Javin. There is, you know, there are quite a few questions. So what I'll do is I'll try to club them up. One question that has come up, uh, it's a more conceptual question, but I like it. Um, Steve, I think it's for you, uh, aimed largely at you, is that what role do you see misperception here playing in terms of the relation in this bilateral relationship, right? Uh, you did mention that uh, Xi Jinping is an ideological sort of a leader, but even ideologues have certain parameters around, based on which they move forward. What are the parameters that we are really looking at? I've heard the term geology or Xi Jinping thought kind of used and abused quite a lot, but what is the fundamentals that we are talking about and how does that really feed into China's perception or misperception of its neighborhood as such, especially in the case of India. Jabin, the question for you is, and I'm clubbing quite a few questions here that are coming up, uh, are, is, is this whole idea of you know, the third parties, whether it's Pakistan and you have mentioned the two-front threat that India is kind of binding itself into uh, in very substantial way, at least in my thought since 1965, right? The whole Indo Indian diplomatic machinery and military machinery was aimed at least in principle to avoid or neutralize that threat, at least in an operational sense, even if the strategic synergies between China and Pakistan existed in different shapes and forms. Uh, but there are countries like Nepal you have mentioned too. And we have seen this a recent kind of border issue that came up around Nipu Lake. And you've mentioned a bit about India's turning point in 2015. There are also reports around the Myanmar trijunction, 
this is a trijunction which is not being talked about as much. Myanmar is actually a very important country as far as BRI goes, uh, perhaps if not as much, uh, if not more, at least as much as important as, as Pakistan in some ways, given, given how important Chopu is. And this is a trijunction, the, the Valong trijunction, where 62 and since then, there has been a lot of friction, really. It's really kind of a very difficult terrain to kind of map, but, uh, but is very strategically consequential. How do you see in terms of India's relationship with these relative, you know, with other neighbors uh, panning out in the future? Of course, now this is not to make you repeat your point of India's uh, regional connectivity projects, but if one would say that India has to reconceptualize its strategy in dealing with countries like Nepal, in dealing with countries like Myanmar, uh, keeping both its economic capability, which has become very limited as Steve hinted towards earlier uh, in recent times with the recession hitting in, what are the sources of power that it can utilize in trying to balance Chinese influence uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the forthcoming years? So really these two questions, and then we'll come to the next round. Thank you. Jabin, would you like to come in first this time? Thank you. Sure. Um, so I think fundamentally, um, I think the countries in South Asia aren't really in a position to completely, uh, you know, hold the gun to India's head. Uh, they have their limitations. Uh, the Chinese also have the limitations uh, geographically, culturally, and whatnot. Uh, so in a sense, the neighborhood first policy, despite initial missteps, I think uh, in, in the last few months, uh, I think we've certainly seen a recalibration of that policy. Uh, the outreach to Nepal, for example, has been going pretty well, at least from reports. Uh, but essentially, you know, the neighborhood first is also not a new concept. What it needs is really a return to the origin, uh, which is the original concept, which is of the Gujarat doctrine. And accept completely and fully that India needs to be the uh, bigger hearted player as it were. Reciprocity cannot be expected of uh, its smaller neighbors. It needs to allay the fears that the smaller neighbors have of Indian hegemony or in a return to Indian hegemony by allowing smaller neighbors to interact with other powers. Uh, and then you see that some initial steps of that happening, for example, by the American presence in the Maldives, for example. So some of that rethink, I think, is going on. But I come back to what uh, Professor Sang said about um, you know, India's Indian Ocean strategy. Fundamentally, to be able to deal with, and this is to answer the second part of your question, fundamentally, to be able to deal with China, we need to have asymmetric advantages elsewhere. We really cannot match a soldier for soldier or you know, um, dollar for dollar on the LAC, but where we have an advantage is the Indian Ocean, not in order to threaten China, but in order to build up capacity in Indian Ocean neighbors, uh, to reach out to them better, that capacity needs to be built up. Uh, you know, India needs to keep its promises. A fundamental problem with Indian diplomacy in its neighborhood or elsewhere is that India promises a great deal, but does not seem to be able to have the capacity to keep its promises. A lot of this has to do with internal issues or internal restructuring issues. For example, the military is not used full well as an arm of Indian diplomacy. The hierarchy in China is the PLA ranks, outranks the MOFA by far, but in India it's reverse. And the Indian military is not an instrument of Indian foreign policy or Indian diplomacy as much as it could be. And the only instrument really that works in this uh, sort of uh, situation is the Indian Navy, which is the most underfunded of all three services. Quite the opposite of what uh, Professor Sang was talking about with respect to the PLA Navy. Um, so, and with, you know, the tri-junction issue with Myanmar or the fish tails, uh, you know, with, between Arunachal and China, I mean, this has been something that has been going on for a very long time, extremely complex, but these are situations that have been sort of shall we say war gamed or senior, you know, scenarios have been built up on these for a very long time. I don't see this as fundamentally uh, creating problems, any additional problems in the India-China relationship than already exist. I think bigger issues include our uh, relationship over technology, our relationship in terms of uh, the Indian Ocean and in terms of how India builds its ties with the United States and neighbors further afield. 
Uh, those, I think, are the key, key issues in the India-China relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Steve. I don't know whether you know, uh, Avinash, that I have been working with a colleague on a project on Xi Jinping thought for about a year. So I kind of rather welcome this question about how we should uh, define the strategic parameter of, in Xi Jinping's thought in terms of his approach to foreign policy. Xi Jinping thought is remarkably thin. It's nothing quite like Mao Zedong thought, where you have really quite a lot of stuff in there. And so to sum up in a very sort of uh, slightly naughty and simplistic way, Xi Jinping thought on foreign policy is quite simply about making China great again by underlying the central leadership of the Communist Party and making China rich and powerful in that process. And in the more practical strategic terms, the Chinese government does not accept the implication of the American change of the American Asia Pacific Command into the Indo-Pacific Command. The Chinese government still basically see it as the Asia Pacific issue, rather than an Indo-Pacific issue, which is why they are not taking India as seriously as they should. And in that conception, the very centerpiece is in fact a little island called Taiwan. Taiwan is absolutely critical in that strategic concept, conception because Taiwan is right in the middle of the first island chain in the marine time strategies that the Chinese government has developed and now intends to put into reality. And Taiwan exists and continues to exist as a free and independent entity because of American support. If one way or the other, actual use of force or threat to use force result in Taiwan becoming part of China, it would have implied that the Americans would either have been deterred effectively or sufficiently defeated to pull back. Either way, the Americans would be a spent force in the region. Japan will have to completely rethink its strategic uh, approach, the whole of Southeast Asia will simply sail with the prevailing wind directions and side with China, whatever the Chinese government's positions will be. And the whole region will fundamentally change in the whole strategic balance. And this is what they really are focusing on for the next 10, 20, or so years. I don't think they're even looking at 30 years. They're not, I think, planning on allowing the current state of affair to continue to exist beyond a maximum, say, about 20 years or so. And of course, in this calculation, once they have got that fixed, India will fall into place. I mean, what will, what will India then do? What can India then do? What can Europe do? What can Australia do? if America essentially will go back to the uh, American continent. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Uh, we have a question, I think, uh, from, from Shovik, Dutta. Shovik, would you like to speak up? I know you have written it down, but if you, if you want to spell it out, please, the floor is all yours. You're on mute, Shovik, sorry. We can't see you or hear you. Okay. Um, there was a treaty recently between China, between the ASEAN countries and China and also South Korea, Japan, Australia. Um, uh, it was sort of a trade treaty called the RECEP and it was signed in Vietnam. Um, it was signed in the last month in Vietnam and um, India wasn't part of this treaty. India wasn't a signatory to the treaty, but India does trade a lot with China. So um, um, I, I, was, I thought India is kind of left out in the cold a bit. Uh, 
Um, and also there is the issue of uh, the 1962 India-China war and the territorial issues from, the, from that war in Kashmir and in Arunachal Pradesh have not been resolved, have not really been resolved. Um, and, that, and that issue could flare up again. Um, so, I mean, um, those, those, uh, those are the things that, um, that really occur to me the most. Sorry, could, I, could, I, could I also request you to quickly introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is uh, Shubik Data, and I'm uh, um, a teacher of English as a foreign language and um, an interpreter for NHS and social services. Um, Thank you. Jade and Steve, either of you would like to take that? Um, I'm quite happy to uh, yeah. have the first go, and if uh, Jaybent would like to come in. I think um, the border wars definitely is still in the background, is something which I think both countries still take very seriously. Um, again, I think the Indians uh, were more, take it a, a bit more seriously than the Chinese, but the Chinese do take that very seriously, and they are aware that uh, it is something that can and may well blow up at some stage. Now, in terms of the AUSAP, the AUSAP was a fundamentally ASEAN initiative, um, not a Chinese initiative. Even though the Chinese like to come out and claim that as a victory that they have uh, joined AUSAP and the Americans are still not part of the TPP. The big di distinction between the TPP or the um, modified version of the TPP now, and the RCEP is that one is a very deep um, trade pack. The other one is a very shallow one. The RCEP is a very, very shallow uh, trade pack. It really does not provide a kind of economic integration and free trade area in a very powerful, significant way. Um, but the fact that the Chinese are able to sign it, give them a basis to say that maybe, just maybe, that they can also be parties to a modified version of the TPP moving forward, now that there is a change of government in Washington, that the new Biden administration might be looking at the option and the possibility of the United States becoming part of the uh, TPP all over again. And the Chinese are clearly already making the arguments that if a country like Vietnam can be parties to it, then surely China can be parties to it. Whether, whether, whether this will wash or not, I think remains to be seen. A lot will depends on how the Americans will play it with it. Um, I think the Japanese who have taken over the uh, coordination of the TPP um, will probably very welcome the Americans to rejoin. I mean, what I think often we forget is that the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, which then got translated by the Americans to the uh, Indo-Pacific Command was not originally an American invention. It was a Japanese invention, which the Americans have borrowed and the Japanese very happily surrender that and basically say, you take ownership of that, you run with it, it's now all your concept and we support you. I think if the Americans want to try something like that with a version of modification of the TPP, it's very likely the Japanese would uh, take a similar approach, whereas the Japanese may not be quite as open-armed in welcoming China to be party to it in the way that the uh, Chinese are accepted by outside. Thank you, Steve. Jivin. Yeah, um, so India's primary concern with the RCEP was that it would allow China a backdoor into India. India has consistently refused to sign a free trade agreement with the Chinese. Uh, and there were already complaints about the India-ASEAN FTA. Uh, 
So, uh, and of course, uh, even RCEP would not have opened up the services uh, sectors in each of these uh, Asian economies to India as much as India would have liked. So India didn't find any need to be part of the RCEP. That's the official sort of line. And it, it, at least on the services front, I think it's quite correct. But essentially, this is a problem of a lack of state capacity as well as a lack of capacity in India's uh, economic players to be able to compete on the global market. It's a sign of an unwillingness to open up India's economic entities to competition from the outside. Uh, now, if India uses time, I use the time, I think it's a very short window to build up national champions like the Chinese have done, then yes, staying out of our set makes sense. But I don't think you can really run Quad or the Indo-Pacific without an economic component. India cannot really, and if TPP comes around, will India be in a position to join the TPP then? I mean, those are really the contradictions or the questions that uh, the Indian government uh, needs to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Jabin and Steve on that. Uh, one last round of questions. We have 15 minutes left, or maybe depending on time, uh, we can have one, one more after this. Uh, there are two or three different questions, but, you know, of course, related to the themes that we have been talking about. First question, I mean, this is by Nick Whedon, is, is about the Tibetan diaspora that is still living in India, right? I mean, this is a diaspora that came broadly, or at least the, the first generation of diaspora came around during 1950s, late 50s, and then in the 60s. And it's a very politically charged issue, not just between India and China, uh, but the fact that a government in exile is, is living in India, is operating from India, the Dalai Lama is there as the spiritual leader. Where do you see this going? And I ask, Jamin, you know, I would like to know your thoughts on how government of India is really uh, thinking about this issue, given the kind of celebration that we saw recently in Indian media about the use of the Special Frontier Force, which is uh, which which is made up of Tibetan kind of fighters who are trained by the Indian Army, and which has become a very central part of India's defense organization, and very clearly aimed towards China, even though the SFF has been used elsewhere. And Steve, is this an issue, of course, of the Dalai Lama and the politics of who would come after the Dalai Lama? He's 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 uh, he's not the youngest, and these are concerns around which there's a lot of politicking happening. What is China's thought and what is China's kind of, is there any serious planning in your view happening on the Tibet question and the question of Dalai Lama as we move forward? Uh, the second question is by Pooja Bhattacharya. Uh, amidst all these issues that we are talking about, right, the high politics of it and perhaps on the ground dynamics in Ladakh and around the boundary, uh, what about academic cultural exchange and job opportunities, which have already kind of been lost in this sort of decoupling that we are talking about? There's a lot of people to people connectivity, which also gets lost in broader, bigger narratives of rivalry and competition. What do you think, who would be the loser? Of course, you know, uh, and, or, or let me rephrase this in a way that, where do you see this going? Is this, some, is this a tool that can be developed to build better empathy and understanding between the two sides uh, for future purposes, even in a different leadership. Let's assume Xi Jinping is not at helm and Narendra Modi is not at helm. Uh, who, are these relationships uh, good enough to kind of take this conversation forward? And the last question really here is, uh, it's, it's a question by a, a student at UCL, Alex McDougall. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about Pakistan? Of course, Revan, you have mentioned the Pakistan and India's conundrum with, with Pakistan. But Steve, it's quite interesting that China, who, which does not take India seriously, takes Pakistan super seriously. Uh, so what, what explains this contradiction? Like, arguably, of course, I mean, we know the larger history of Sino-Pakistan relations, you know, this, this, the treaty, the boundary treaty, which was signed in 1963, China, Pakistan's decision to give up on territory in Kashmir, which it considered its own at some point to develop a strategic partnership with China was very consequential. But we have seen this relationship endure despite a lot of turbulence and internal contradictions. How do you see Pakistan figure in Chinese thought largely, given the lack of seriousness, according to you, that uh, Beijing has for India? Thank you. And in this case, could I request now Steve to come in first, if possible? Thank you. Certainly, um, Avinash, I think we got all together about uh, 13, 14 minutes. Um, 
On the issue of Tibet, the Chinese government is calculating that biology will work in their favor, that it will simply remove the Dalai Lama, and the Chinese government will then insist on the formal process for the reincarnation, and therefore the reincarnation will have to happen under Chinese jurisdiction. And the Chinese, in fact, will choose the next Dalai Lama and will bring that Dalai Lama up, educate him properly, in quotation marks, so that the new Dalai Lama will know what to do, who will therefore be a spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism, a good Tibetan, and above all, a good Chinese citizen. And a lot of the problems will then be removed, and then it will become blatantly obvious that the Indian government's support of the uh, Tibetan exile movement in India is really not entirely cricket, shall one say. And of course, the Chinese will use a different metaphor rather than cricket. Um, in terms of the academic exchange, I think we have to bear in mind that we now use the term decoupling, mostly in response to misguided policy on economics that were raised by uh, Donald Trump in 2019. But if you are looking at decoupling in terms of the people-to-people -people academic type of exchanges, it really started with Xi Jinping back in 2013, when he issued document number nine, which was a top secret document, which we now all see, and you can just Google it and you'll find it on the internet, by somebody who leaked the, the document and pay a price for incarceration for it. Document number nine basically outlaw a whole lot of Western concepts like universalism, constitutionalism, uh, free media, and the whole lot of things. So by the implementation of article, of, of document number nine, Chinese academies are being closed off from a lot of contacts with the outside world and therefore um, India too. Now we all lose in something like that. I don't think anybody gains by losing uh, people to people contact academic exchanges. But I will say that the, our Chinese colleagues, our liberal minded, uh, good academics in China probably are the people who lose out the most because they get punished for simply doing the sort of things that um, Jabin, you in India, I in London, do on a regular basis. And that's not good for anybody. In terms of the Pakistan, I think it's a very good and important question because if one asks about China's airlines, then one country stands out as China's most loyal ally. In fact, the only true ally. And that is called Pakistan. It's not North Korea. It's not the other remaining Leninist party states like Vietnam or Cuba or even Laos or Cambodia. It is Pakistan. It's a long standing, only true loyal friend that China has, in spite of its new attempts to reach out to the world through every mean possible, regular diplomacy, public diplomacy, soft power, sharp power, you name it, they try it. They only got Pakistan as one reliable, dependent, true ally. I think that kind of explains why the Chinese do take Pakistan rather more seriously than they do take um, India. But even having said so, the Chinese don't exactly treat Pakistan as a complete equal partner in that equation either. It's a junior partner. I think the Pakistanis know about that. Uh, they live with it. Are they really so comfortable and happy about it? I don't think so. I think when you have uh, Imran Khan, the prime minister, being asked about Xinjiang, and he will say, I don't know anything about it. Uh, 
knowing full well that nobody in the world will believe that the prime minister of Pakistan can be completely ignorant of what happens in Xinjiang. Um, he knows, he, he knows the, the nature of the relationship and he knows how he needs to play that game. And because he does, the Chinese are happy about it and they will continue to have a good relationship there. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, Javin, the final yeah. word. So I'd like to sort of, again, back up what uh, Professor Song uh, is saying. Let me start with the Tibetan diaspora issue first. Um, now on the SFF and uh, things like the surgical strikes, you know, the SFF has been used, as you said, Avinash, it has been used before. Uh, so this is not, not something new. The advertisement given to it, the publicity given to it is what is new. Um, now on the question of Dalai Lama, um, the Indians are also hoping biology will act in their favor. And the Dalai Lama lives to 120, I think what he says uh, he will live to. But, um, you know, jokes apart, I think the essential problem is that the Indian government doesn't have a policy for the post Dalai Lama phase. Uh, one has to remember that while the Tibetan exile population is about 160,000 outside of uh, Chinese territory, um, the membership of the Communist Party of China branch inside Tibet, inside TAR, is 200,000 people. So post the Dalai Lama, I think one can very well, uh, I mean, my sort of very realistic assessment is that's the end of the Tibetan movement because there is not going to be the charismatic figure that the Dalai Lama was to lead the movement. And if the Tibetans turn into violence in some form, then you know they go the same way as the Uyghur movement generally has uh, also. I mean, very little attention from the rest of the world. So overall, I think the scorecard is in China's favor. Now, in terms of academic uh, and cultural exchanges, uh, you know, this is not the first time the sort of damage is going to be done. Post-62, also there was a rapid closing of doors or exchanges between India and China. And that sort of uh, sort of had meant two generations of Indian scholars of China really were lost. Uh, and Indian capacity on China was uh, substantially gutted because of the 62 war. But I think today it's going to be, it's not going to be so bad. Uh, we have other sources, uh, more Indians today speak Chinese. Uh, there's a Taiwan uh, possibility to study Chinese language or even American sources. UK sources. Uh, but I think the fundamental problem is, as Steve said, that with document nine, that precludes Chinese academics from speaking honestly and openly about the problems in the relationship. So you need honest exchanges between the two sides in order for this relationship to move forward. And, uh, you know, we already suffered in India, Indian academics are only exposed to the South Asianists in China. Whereas if Indian academics were more able to engage with the general IR of foreign policy people in China, I think we would have a much more fruitful conversation. That has not happened. Now on one final point on Pakistan that sort of underlines how much uh, India has lost is that in 1950, uh, Field Marshal Ayub Khan actually called for India and China to unite, uh, India and Pakistan to unite against the communist threat of China. That didn't go anywhere. And today we have the China-Pakistan relationship where it is at India's cost. Yeah, that's all. Jim, just if I may, one, one last question. I'm really tempted, we still have two minutes left. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and I hope Steve will permit me, you know, as, as Jibin being the guest speaker to take that last question to him. Uh, you mentioned Akhand Bharat. You mentioned this whole idea, the Hindutva idea of greater India at the beginning, which quite struck with me, a chord that, we have often heard about Nehruvian foreign policies or the Nehruvian influence on India's foreign policy thought and practice, uh, even though now there is evidence that this was, you know, this idea of foreign policy uh, being this kind of a sector of policy consensus in India is a contested idea. But Nehru as a prime minister played a very powerful role. And we know that history of this collision of, of you know, the idea of India being an Asian power and China viewing India's idea of being an Asian power as an imperialist plot or British or American power lurking behind Indian ambition in Asia. And that, as Steve earlier mentioned, uh, is something that the CPC ideologically believes itself to be uh, quite the reverse of it, right? China can never be an imperialist. 
How does Hindu nationalism as an ideology complicate India's postures and its relationship really? I mean, we know that this the idea of uh, a muscular foreign policy, the idea of assertive foreign po policy practices is something which is very kind of deeply rooted in that kind of ideological DNA. And we have seen that pan out, not just vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, but also other countries. With China, do you think this is somewhere the this, this idea of Akhand Bharat it's a real kind of ideological, but also a practical uh, stone wall, really. Uh, and how does this, how is, is that going, going to affect the, the thoughts, uh, you know, the policy thought and practice of this government moving forward? Um, thank you, Avinash, for that question. I think um, I sort of wanted to leave it out there at the end because it's a very important question, something that we should get back to at some point later. But very briefly, I'd like to say that, you know, um, Xi Jinping had a statement uh, some years ago. He said, uh, what is it? Yo yao ta the young sir, which means big should look big. So, you know, Nehruvian foreign policy had a certain vision of India's place in the world. It certainly wanted India as a major important player, but it still had the uh, view that countries needed to treat each other with respect and that we needed a post-colonial uh, a post-imperial narrative in India's foreign policy. He did take actions, uh, maybe rough-handed actions on occasion. But uh, what is different with the Hindutva uh, nationalist approach to Indian foreign policy is that it forecloses certain options. Uh, so if India is a larger power, uh, you know, Nepal as another Hindu country will always be a junior partner. Pakistan, uh, because it's a Muslim country or a Muslim majority country, cannot be a, a friendly part. Uh, even on Tibet, I mean, we just talked about Tibet. The thing is, Akhand Bharat, depending on which map of Akhand Bharat that you look at, there is Tibet is sometimes part of Akhand Bharat, Afghanistan is part of Akhand Bharat, or Myanmar is part of Akhand Bharat. So, you know, with that kind of a conception, how do you imagine that there is a policy or a relationship of equality between India and its neighbors. So that really is a fundamental problem, I think, that is at play, which is why I also refer to this Tianxia concept or all under heaven for the Chinese or what I call new Tianxia. I mean, this approach is really somewhat similar for both India and China. This identity as great civilization powers and because of various shortcomings in their present circumstances, they feel that they have to sort of refer back to history as a prong or as a crutch to be able to justify their rise, their presence, their acting big to their neighbors or to the rest of the world. The rest of the world will not get it perhaps, but that doesn't stop them from trying. And I think that really, I mean, I've sort of summarized it very quickly, but yeah, that's about it, I guess. Javin, thank you so much for that very important summary, something worth thinking about for all of us as we move into this, this uh, another year, uh, another pandemic hit year and, and very fraught relationship between China, India and Pakistan and India. But on that note, I would like to thank Professor Steve Sang. I would like to thank Professor Jabin Jacob for taking the time out this afternoon, evening in India, uh, and really kind of unpacking a lot of the, the issues that kind of define or have come to define unfortunately so in current circumstances, the Sino-Indian relationship. And I, for one, am convinced that this is a bilateral which will have a very powerful impact, whether you know, it's, it's in the form of cooperation or rivalry in the shaping of the international order as we move forward, uh, multipolar or whichever form we are really talking about, this relationship is something worth keeping, eye keeping an eye out for. Uh, I'm, I would like to also apologize to a lot of our attendees there were quite a few questions. Unfortunately, we cannot take all of them, but I try to make sure that we cover all sorts of kind of empirical and thematic ground. Thank you so much for participating this afternoon and for some very important questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing you again in our, in our webinars in the next term and wishing you all a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye.